All right, so we're going to get started uh, with exercise 207. And um, like I said, we, we have a tendency to flip back and forth. So we do some Rhino, then we go into V-Ray, then we go back to Rhino, and then we go back to V-Ray. And uh, it, it is important for you at this stage to start to understand. We, we obviously know how to put materials on objects, but now we have to understand how the materials look on a particular object. And a lot of you tried to do it with the house. You put like brick on the side of the house and the bricks were, you know, eight foot bricks and it didn't look right. So today we're gonna go through something that's called texture mapping. And what texture mapping does is it controls how a material is applied to an object and what it looks like on an object. And so it's something that you'll end up doing a lot of as you go forward, and it's also kind of important going into your, your first assignment, 201, you're going to have to deal with texture mapping on that. And how it's texture mapped is really going to affect your grade for 201. So it's important that you really think through this process and whatever. But I have to introduce the, the overall concept of texture mapping using some just basic objects so we can kind of go through it. Uh, and then we're going to end up today back with that um, glass wall and the bridge. And we're going to set those up in a block reference file. And I'll show you guys how to do that as well. So I'm going to start first by setting up just kind of a basic V-Ray scene. And then I'll, I'll create a few objects. I suggest uh, a, a rectangle that's 12 feet by 1 feet, 1 foot by 8 foot high. The reason that that is set up that way is it's kind of like a wall. And we're going to be modeling a lot of those kinds of objects. And then the other ones are, are, are more uh, standard. So before I begin, I'm going to set up um, in my layers, I want a layer for my environment. Um, and I'm kind of taking this a step further than we've done. Before, I always just did an infinite plane and, and maybe a sun. In this case, I'm going to call it environment. And then under the environment layer, I'll have a sublayer for my infinite plane, which I'm just going to call IP. And on that IP layer, I'm going to create the V-Ray infinite plane, which remember is that rectangle with the arrows going off in, in four directions, which gives me that infinite plane. There it is. That's on my IP layer. On my environment here, I'm also going to have a layer for light. We'll make that the current layer. And then I'm going to create a basic directional light. So remember, I used that box technique to, to quickly create the, the directional light. The directional light that we're using is the hidden button on the V-Ray toolbar. Got to love it. Uh, end of direction light vector is there. Start is right there. And I'll get rid of my little helper box. And so there's my light. I have a light in the scene. So I'm starting with those basic considerations. The one other thing I probably should do is in my V-Ray options, I should turn my background. So let me go to my environment. And I'll turn my background to be white, which a lot of you have been doing as a habit anyway. So it's under the environment drawer. It's this reflection refraction or background. I'm setting that to white as well. So now I have a light, I have an infinite plane. Essentially, I have ground. That's what the infinite plane is. And I have my background set up as white. So we're, we're ready to start with our modeling. Uh, first thing was a wall. So I'll just use the primitive box shape here. And I'm going to go uh, at 12 feet, comma, 1 foot. Sorry, wrong direction. I had myself flipped around here. Try that one more time. At 12. Feet by eight feet. Sorry, my scale was off here. There we go. Zoom in there a little bit. There is my little my little wall. I need a few other things. We're going to do a box, and I'm suggesting about four feet by four feet on the side, something like that. Um, let me just double check a cube, a sphere. I don't know why I say circle on there. Um, go in here to primitives. We'll do a diameter of four feet. I want that to be raised up above the uh, plane. I don't want half of, half of this. Easiest way to do that would be in one of these side views. I'll just drag that up a little bit. And then what else did I want? I wanted a pyramid, a cylinder.
By the way, on the pyramid here, if I wanted it to have more sides than just four, notice that it's number of sides. I can specify five, six, eight, whatever I want. Um, there. And I think I said cone, too. The reason that I'm creating all of these basic shapes is that I want to be able to uh, experiment with them and show you guys how textures apply to various shapes. So I have all of these shapes kind of arranged. Um, they don't have to be arranged perfectly. We're just going to work our way through each of the objects and, and apply materials to them. Uh, I do want all of these. Oops. Let me lock the infinite plane so I can't move it. I want all of these to be on their own layer. So I'm going to put them back up on the default layer. So we'll change object layer. They're on default. And now I need to start working with these objects and applying a material. So when I am loading a material for today's exercise, I want something that has a very distinct pattern. So like wood siding or brick or something that's really obvious, because that's what we're working with. So I'm going to start with uh, loading up a material. So I'll go into my, my V-Ray material editor. And let me purge these materials. There we go. And let me load a material. And I'll go to my, sorry, I'll go to my flash drive. I'll go to resources, V-Ray, V-Ray materials. Um, and I'm going to use a, a wood siding for this. But you could, you, like I said, you can pick any, um, any material that's like that. Um, this one's fine. Brick would be fine. Something along those lines. Actually, I'm going to load a different one. Yeah, I like that one better. So I'm going to load that one. <laughs> um, so I can apply this material to individual objects, or I can apply it to the whole layer. And so the way materials work in V-Ray and in Rhino, um, at the base level, any object that exists on a layer, if it has no material, will have the default material of the layer assigned to it. If you override the material and assign a material to the object, that will override any material that's assigned to the layer. So the layer is lowest in the chain. The object itself is highest in the chain. So in this case, I could assign this material that I wanted to the default layer. So I'm going to assign material, oh, excuse me, apply material to layer. And I'm going to pick, oh, I want it on default layer. So we'll go ahead and say OK. And you notice over here in the layer stack that under material, I now have a material that's assigned to it. So I can't really see it on these objects because I'm just in my shaded view. But if I switch to my rendered view, we could see a kind of a preview of what that looks like on the various objects. Okay, and remember, the preview is, is just that. It's a preview. It's not perfect. So let's look first at just the wall in the background. I'm going to go ahead and hold down Shift and hide the rest of these objects. So I'm just going to type hide, make them go away, and then I'm going to focus just on this wall to start. And so like I said, I wanted a pattern that was a very distinct pattern, which it obviously is. And I want to take a look at what it looks like right now. So let me come around to the end. So it doesn't look terrible in its existing state. It, it, Rhino and V-Ray were kind of guessing that this is a box. So we're going to try to apply a default mapping to it. And it might not be too bad. So in this case, it's not too bad. But I want a finer level of control over how this really applies. So uh, what I'm going to do is with the object selected, I'm going to go to my Properties menu, which is right over here. It's next to Layers. And we have the basic object properties, like uh, it'll tell you what layer the object is on and that sort of thing. But as we come across, we can move to material. And when I do that, it says the material is assigned by the layer. And if I come one step further, I have this little kind of curving piece of paper with a checkerboard pattern on it. And it says texture mapping. That's the one I want to clip on, click on. So when I click on that, I'm presented with a variety of texture mapping options. We have unwrap. We have custom mapping. Then we move into surface mapping, planar mapping, box mapping, sphere mapping, cylindrical mapping, etc. So in our ideal world, these presets can help us a lot as we set this up. So this object, while it's not a cube, is kind of close to a cube. So if I were to pick the cube or the box mapping, that's pretty close. It's got four sides. Let's try that. So I'll go ahead and apply box mapping. And 
by default, a lot of times people click on box mapping and then they don't do anything else. Well, there is a prompt up here. It says first corner of base, or do you want a bounding box? A bounding box just says my whole object, put a box around my object. So I do just want the bounding box. Then it says coordinate system. Do I want it to be in the world coordinate or the C plane? We're going to stick with world. Do I want the object to be capped, i.e., does it have a material on top or not? Yes, I do. And it's now done. So the front doesn't look too much different, but the sides do look different. So let me zoom in at the, the sides and the top here. So notice along the top that suddenly there's a lot of repetition of all the little pieces, and it doesn't look like the same material. Furthermore, on the end, it's kind of all squished together. So just because I applied the box mapping doesn't mean it's necessarily set up correctly for me just yet. So once it's been applied, though, I get a bunch more options that show up in the texture mapping down here at the bottom. So if we look down here, we have a couple things that'll start to matter. The first one is something called x, y, z size. And so you'll see here that we have 144, 12, and 96. Those are in inches. So I said it was 12 feet by 1 foot by 96 inches. So it's, it's got the size of my object correct. Okay? But I have to choose how I want the texture map to be applied. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the 111. And if I click on that 111 box, it's going to apply it evenly, 1, 1, and 1. It's really, really small, though, which isn't quite what we wanted. Right? So you see how I'm going through the options and exploring them. So let's go back to the original, which is right here. That's the one with the, the little caret and the bracket. And let's try instead x equals y equals z. And when I do that, it averages out where the, the size should be. And if we look at it now, our texture map right, looks pretty good. And it wraps around nicely on this end. And it also wraps around nicely at the top. If I wasn't happy with that, I could change the value. So I could drop it down to, say, 12 by 12 by 12, for example. And I get a lot more repetition. The 84 is pretty reasonable. Um, I could go 96, 96, and 96. Right? There's, some, there's some happy medium. The x equals y equals z is usually the best option, certainly with the box. Now, I have a few other things. And that is that sometimes I don't want this density to be quite the way it is. So in this case, my wall is 8 feet. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 pieces of siding for those eight feet. I could increase the number of pieces of siding going up if I wanted to. And I'm going to do that down here in the next section called UVW repeat. And you'll see a lot in texture mapping that UVW. Well, UVW is essentially the same as XYZ. It's just for the texture map space rather than for the actual model space of X, Y, and Z. Same concept, though. So here, under UVW repeat, this is uh, like a multiplication. So right now, it's going 1 by 1 by 1. I'm going to click the lock button to keep them the same. And I'm going to up this by 2. So I'll put in 2.0 and hit Enter. It just doubled the number of pieces of siding. So I had 12. I now have 24. I could switch this. I could say, oh, I only want 18. And I could do 1.5. It's basically a multiplier by the repeat number. Okay? So that's now controlled what this wall looks like. If I were to go ahead and render out this wall, we'd get a little bit finer level detail. So I can hit the Render button. And we can see it render in its full form, which gives us more detail and, and better, sharper images, etc. So the box, or the wall, is pretty easy. So let me go ahead and close this. We don't need the final render just yet. Let me go back to Show. So I can get all my boxes or my, all my objects. And let me do the box, which is really simple. Essentially here, I'm just going to come up to my texture mapping. Remember, there's nothing showing below. I'll say apply box mapping. First corner of base or bounding box. I want the bounding box. I want it to be world. And I want it to be capped. There it is. In this case, it's already 48, 48, and 48. So it's already at x, y, and z are equal to each other. And so in this context, 
we see this repetition around the object and up over the top. Now it's not possible in a box for the pattern to be wrapped this way and that way. So obviously one side has to have a seam. It's just the nature of this, this sort of material. But sometimes we don't like the way that this is applied to our particular object. So in this instance, we can change the UVW rotation. So we did the repeat before. We could change the UVW rotation. We can do 90, 90, and 90. And of course, it's not doing what I want it to do. Let me try 0, 0, and 90. Yeah, there we go. Let me just change the W rotation. And it's now rotated the whole pattern the opposite direction. Do you guys see that? So when this was at 0, the pattern was going around here. When this was at 90, it's now going up and down. So it's changed the pattern. To me, working with the UVW rotation is really difficult because I never can understand which one I'm supposed to put a value in. So to combat that and to make it a little bit easier for that, we can show what the mapping looks like on this object using something called a mapping widget. And so up over here in my texture map, and I'm going to do this more times, so this is not the only time I'm going to do this. I'm going to click on this little button for show mapping. And when I do that, my edges of my shape turn into these dotted lines. Do you guys see those dotted lines? Okay. Once those dotted lines appear, I can actually manipulate those dotted lines as if they're a real object. And this is the one place in Rhino where I actually use something called the gumball. And some of you may use the gumball all the time. Some of you may love the gumball. I absolutely despise the gumball except for this. And that's a personal preference. It just has to do with how you work. But I'm going to turn it on. It's down here by Smart Tracking. And what it is is it's this little red, blue, and green widget thing that helps you control your object and allows you to move your object. So with that showing, it's in the center of my object, I can control the mapping on the objects by manipulating this dotted line. So if, for example, I wanted it to go up, see how I'm moving the texture up or down on my object? So I can control where the siding falls, for example, based on that movement. I can also control the rotation. So I could rotate, say, in one direction versus the other. Uh, let me try rotating the whole mapping in that direction. And so now this goes up and over the top that way. And this is the part with the seam. You guys see how that works? So this, a lot of times, is the easiest way of manipulating your object and controlling what these rotation values are can also do. Okay, So I'll do this whole thing again a little bit more. But I wanted to introduce that as part of the concept. When you're done with the mapping, you click the Hide Mapping button. It goes away, and you're back to the start. So that's the square, or the cube. Let's move on to one of our other shapes. Let's look at the sphere. So as I look at this, the sphere is always going to distort this kind of a texture. There's no, there's no real way around that. Uh, it's always going to get kind of squishy at the top. See how it all kind of pinches it? Well, let's see if I can. Unfortunately, it's just dark for you guys up there. I can see it fine on my screen. But it gets kind of squished and pinched at the top. But I can control that mapping as well. So let me take the object, and I'm going to come over here to apply spherical mapping. We'll again do bounding box, world. And now it's applied. It looks very similar to what it was before. But I can go through and do the same kinds of adjustments. So in this case, it was still it's already at x, y, and z because my cube is symmetrical at 48. I could just adjust it, say, to 24 by 24 by 24. And you see we have more repetition than we had before. Let's go 48, 48, and 48. Here we go. I can change the UVW repeat. I could go up to 2, for example, and get a more dense repetition of my pattern. I can also turn on that mapping widget. There it is. And I can manipulate it. So I could rotate the mapping, but I could also rotate it vertically so that it's going this direction instead of the other direction. So it's applying it to this sphere, but I have control over how it's applying depending on you know if you're building a Dyson vacuum or something and you wanted the ball and you wanted it to look a certain way, you could do it. So let's move on to the cylinder, over here at the cylinder. 
So in this case, you can guess where I'm going, apply cylindrical mapping. So the key on these texture mapping is to find the type of object that most closely resembles what you're creating. So let's apply cylindrical mapping to it. Same thing, bounding box, world, capped, yes, and there it is. I can do the same kinds of manipulation. So right now we're at 48, 48, 96. I could say x equals y equals z. I could also do 1 to 1 to 1. This one's a little bit harder to work through because of how it applies. So let's see if I can see how it's close here, but then it stretches on the sides. Right? So it's a little bit challenging in that, in that context because you have to think about it's wrapping from there down. It's wrapping from there down. It's wrapping from there down. So the side is getting bigger because we're trying to wrap it through the side. If we release those two and just did the side around instead, that would make it a little bit easier. So let's try rotating the texture 90 degrees. That totally messed it all up. This is why I don't like doing it that way. Um, no, I don't think it's going to work for me. So in that case, I'll go back to my um, show mapping. Let's see if I can rotate it. Yeah, so it really doesn't like me much. So we're going to stick back to that, um, that first one. Um, I don't know why it won't rotate for me. So there's your standard cylindrical, but I need to change the, there we go. So there's your standard cylindrical that's not capped, that changed the orientation so that it's not tied to the cap anymore. It would be as if it were hollow, in which case my boards are going around it. Sorry, I had to go find the, the different option there. Okay, so same, same rules apply there. When we move on to the cone now, we don't have anything to work with. Uh, that's already, actually let me do the pyramid first, because at least it has sharp sides on it. So let me hide the rest of these here. So in this context, we don't, we have sharp sides, but we don't have in our primitives over here for our texture map, but we don't have a pyramid. So we have to come up with some way of doing it. So I could, for example, apply a box map to it. Let's say bounding box, world, capped, yes. OK, well, in some instances, this might work out OK. Right? Where I have my pieces going around, I'm not really worried about what's happening on the bottom. Um, and in that case, well, maybe it would be all right. The top isn't being skewed because it's applying from each side. So in this case, yeah, even though it's not a pyramid, the box mapping worked out OK. The other option would be to apply a cylindrical mapping to it. We'll do a bounding box. World, I'm going to not cap it. And this similarly works its way around the object. And you have to decide which one has less distortion. You can see that I've got that weird seam line going across there. Um, and then it folds back and goes down there. So yeah, it might not be as good as the box. So you play around with these and see. But the other thing that we can do instead, and I just undid that, is we can do something called an unwrap. And essentially what this is doing is it says, where do you want me to split the object, and then how do I want it to be applied? So those of you that are in uh, 130 or have taken 130, you remember back to when you had to cut out the shapes and then fold them together to make the various objects a little bit. A few of you are nodding. That's good. W essentially, that's what we're doing here. So it says, select what my seams should be. So let's cut down this side, and let's work our way around the object like that. Okay. So once I've done that, I'll go ahead and hit Enter. And it then will apply a texture map based on those seams. It doesn't help too much because we can't see the example of what it looks like or what the material looks like. So I want to actually see it. And I'll do that using this UV Editor button. 
So I'll click on UV Editor, and I'm going to draw a rectangle over here. And I will then see my shape there and the bottom there as they exist on this gray plane. Let me turn off my infinite plane and environment for a second. And of course, my objects ended up on the wrong layer because it weren't set on my object layer. There we go. So I have these objects, which are the unfolded pieces of this, but they're on this blank gray square, which isn't really helping. So over here under my UV editor, I can actually go find the image file for this, or I can work on a numbered file. So in this case, I have the numbers, and you can see the corresponding numbers over here and how they, how they come together. So where we have 73, 83, et cetera, and over here, we should have 73, yep, 73, 83 there. So if I wanted one of these to line up with each other, right, I could start to manipulate these. I could start to rotate these. And I can change how they, uh, sorry, I have ortho on. But just back up as I rotated the wrong way. There we go. And I can control how these are applying. So there's 65, 75, and 85. And if we looked over here, there's 65, 75. So does that make sense? I'm manipulating this as its own thing. For me, it's still hard to look at it as a series of numbers. So instead, you can also actually go find your original image. So let me go find, if I go into my V-Ray materials, I was in siding, it was in wood siding, and it was the uh, rough wood staggered. There it is. And say OK. And now I'll see the actual texture on it itself instead of the numbers, which makes it far easier to kind of work through and manipulate. So I can then manipulate these on top of my surface and decide where the various pieces fit. So this is certainly a more advanced way of controlling how your texture map applies on an object because it's a very fine-tuned way of doing it. In reality, if you can use one of the presets, it's a whole lot better to use the presets because it's faster. If you were doing a object rendering where you were designing some really small object and you were paying a lot of attention to exactly how the material applied to that object, doing this kind of unwrapping might matter. If we're doing an architectural scale, chances are box mapping is going to be our best friend because we're probably doing a wall and we want the texture to be on the wall and, and we'll be happy with it. Okay? So the point is that I want you to go through and I want you to experiment with these various types of texture mapping on your object and, and get comfortable and familiar with what the various options do and how they change uh, what you're seeing, etc. As we move forward, um, let's see here. under part two, so we played around with part one to, to figure out what happens. The next thing under part two is I want you to apply different materials to all of your various objects. So let me go ahead and apply that mapping. It's done. I want you to go find a different material and apply it to all your objects. Adjust the texture mapping so it's appropriate for those various materials. So maybe you put concrete on one, you put brick on one. It's just practice of, of working with different materials and adjusting scale and that sort of thing. So that's part two. Once you're done, you're going to do Sorry, I'm double checking. I think, I think in here I'm implying that you're going to render it after each object changes, but I don't want you to do that. One, one rendering with, with all the different materials applied is, is, is certainly sufficient. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to work with that bridge file and that glass window wall file, and we're going to kind of work with them a little bit more. So let's start by opening up that bridge file. And I'll go to File and then Open. Uh, I'm not going to save the changes. You guys can, can go from there. Let me go into today's exercise here. Sorry, wrong exercise. Uh, the bridge was 205, if I'm not mistaken. I'll open up that bridge file. And so now that I have the bridge file open, I'm not supposed to do that yet. Hold on. All 
All right, well, apparently I didn't save my bridge file. Uh, and this one has, has some little uh, teeth taken out of it. That, that was not intentional. That's something that I was going to do later, but oh well, they're already there. Um, and essentially what I need to do with this is I need to apply the material and I need to deal with the texture mapping on the object. So this was the default texture mapping of the basic concrete. Uh, in this case, maybe I'll apply something with a little bit more uh, excitement. Uh, I'll load up the under concrete here. I'm going to use the rough board form concrete. There we go, which has stripes on it. And I want to apply this to my object. Now, before I do that, though, I want to organize my layers. And so like I said, I failed to save the one that didn't have all this already set up for you, so you'll just have to trust me here. I got rid of all the other layers that were here. So default and layer one, two, three, four. I have one master layer called bridge, and then I have another layer underneath it as a sublayer called bridge or bridge concrete. Delete the infinite plane or any environment layers that are there. Delete any lights that are there. We don't want any of it. All we want is the geometry of the bridge. If there was a different material, if, say, you had uh, a little wooden piece as part of this bridge, I have no idea why you would do this, but let's just say for, for fun that I dropped in two little wood blocks or something. There's two little wood blocks. I would create a sublayer for that. We'll call this wood. And I would then go into my materials, and we'd load up some wood here. OK, remember, I'm going to want to apply a box map to those. So I'll go into Properties. Let me select one of them. I'm going to apply a box mapping to it. So I click on the box map. Bounding box, world, capped, yes. OK, except that my, my texture is going the wrong way. So let me go x equals y equals z. And then let me turn on my texture mapping, and I'm going to rotate this box. So I'll turn on the gumball here. And we'll rotate this like that so that the grain is going in the correct direction. And then when I'm done, we can hide the mapping widget. And there we go. There's my little wood block. Okay. Now, it would be nice if this object, I mean, it already looks decent, but it doesn't have a texture map on it. If I could just say, take this map and put it over here, because I already did the work once. So why do I need to do it again? Well, we can do that. So in this case, we're going to select this object, and we're going to go to this Match Mapping. We'll click on Match Mapping. It says Select Source Object. There's my source object. Now the two objects have exactly the same mapping settings. So once you've set it up once, it's easy to copy the mapping to other examples. So there we go. I have that set up like that. Remember on my layers, I have a bridge layer, I have a concrete layer, I have a wood layer, I have no lights, I have no infinite plane, it's just the object. The other thing that's important is making sure that the object is at point zero, 00. So let me move the object right from that corner to 0, 0, 0. So it's right at the origin. Um, did I, I might not have uh, texture mapped the, the object here. So let me do that really fast. Um, let me apply a box map to it. Bounding box, world, capped, yes. And there it is. Oh, and you know what? I wanted to change the material so that it was the uh, rough board form. Apply material to layer. I'm going to go on concrete. And now we can see what that looks like as it goes across the object. Let me take this and let me make a few adjustments. x equals y equals z. And let's repeat it a little bit more dense, so maybe 1.5. So. Yeah, that looks about right. Okay, So I'm reasonably happy with how this turned out. Looks like my top isn't going in the same direction that I want it to. So maybe I would go back, show my mapping, and then rotate this so that it was going in that direction more with the grain versus against it. OK, so once I'm all done with this, I'm going to go ahead and hide that mapping. Oops. 
There we go. I'm going to save this file. And in this case, it's called bridge. So I've done the materials. I have a very clean layer structure. This is now ready to bring into another file. And so could I take this, this object and copy and paste it a bunch in this file? Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. But in Rhino, when we're building really complex buildings, it's nice to use referenced files instead of just copying and pasting within your, your own file. And this is kind of like in the world of InDesign, where you're doing a layout and you reference a link to a file. And when it comes time for the final output, it goes and gets the high quality version and drops it in. Rhino can do essentially the same thing using a block or a block reference. If you've worked in AutoCAD, these are a lot like XRefs in AutoCAD, a uh, little bit different than blocks. Rhino only has blocks. That's it. So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new file. So I'll go to new, large objects, inches, I'll say open. And now in this file, I'm going to set up the scene for what I am trying to create. So this is where the infinite plane belongs. The environmental factors, the light, long term the sun, those kinds of things are going to be in this file. This is the master file. So I'll go ahead and create a few things here. We'll rename the default layer to be environment. I'll make a sublayer for environment called infinite plane IP. On the IP layer, I will go ahead and drop in the infinite plane. There it is. I will have another layer for light. And this is similar to what I did earlier. So I have inf uh, environment, oops, spelled incorrectly. I have infinite plane. I have light. I'm going to get rid of layer 6 and 7. I'll press the little delete key. All I have is environment, infinite plane, and light. I do actually need the, um, the light, though, so let me drop that in. OK, so now I have the light, I have the infinite plane, and I have the environment that's set up. And so from here, I'm going to bring in that block referenced file. So I'm going to go reference that bridge file that I just created. So I'll go to File, and I'll go to, uh, excuse me, Edit, Blocks, Insert Block Instance. Or I could press Control-I. And that brings up this Insert dialog box. And so in the Insert dialog box here, under Name, I'm going to click the little folder that's right next to it. And then I'll go Find that bridge file. So that was in 205. There it is, bridge. And I'll say open. And once I have the bridge selected, it knows where it exists on the, on the file. Insert as a block instance. And then we have options to specify a insertion point or a scale or a rotation. I just leave the defaults just fine. And I just go ahead and say OK, because you can manipulate it once it's inserted into the scene anyway. So we'll say OK. Then we get the insert file options. And these are really important. So first off, we can give it a name if we want. Bridge is fine. Then we come down here. And right here, under block definition type, we want to click the option for link. Now, this has a little bit of risk associated with it, because if we lost the original bridge file, we would no longer have this in our model. It's kind of like an InDesign. You guys have had this happen, I'm sure, before. We lost some file, and it turns out blurry when you went to try to print it. right? It's totally annoying. So your file structure matters. Where you save this stuff matters. And when we get to the cabin at the end of the semester, you're going to have lots and lots of these coming in. So you really need to keep track of where everything is. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be critical. But if you leave it as linked, it doesn't bog down your, your Rhino file. It doesn't slow things down because it's still a reference. So you go to render, it goes gets the high quality version. But when we're working on it, you're not going to slow everything down. And so if you imagine, for example, being in the 221 skyscraper studio, and you have some detail of like a window that's repeated a thousand times in your drawing. If you had a thousand copies of this window, it would start to make a really big slow Rhino file. If you have a thousand block reference copies, it's not going to slow down your Rhino file because they all exist in it as an external file. So it's important to get used to this setup. So it's set up as a link. Then we have down here layer style active or reference. 
Personally, I prefer referenced links because they'll show up differently in your layer menu, and it'll be more obvious that way. So I leave it set as reference, and I'll go ahead and say OK at this point. It's then going to ask me for an insertion point. Where do you want me to stick this file? So for right now, we'll just stick it at 0, 0, and we'll drop it in right there. Let me lock the infinite plane so I can't select it. And so there is my file. If I turn on, if I turn into rendered mode, all of my materials and everything come through with the file. The texture mapping comes with the file. Now, everything in the file would come with it. So if I had an infinite plane, that would come with it, which is why I don't want one. So the environment is separate from. The only thing that will not come through in a block is a light source, a V-Ray light source. It will not come through. So long term, down the road, in the, at the end of the semester when we do lighting, you have to always put the V-Ray light in the final master file, not in the referenced file. It, it'll make sense when we get there, but I like to at least point it out. The other thing that I should have done first is it's always a good idea to have a layer. Oops, I don't want it to be a sub-layer here. Let me get it out. There we go. To have a layer called blocks that these blocks go on to. So let me take this object and put it on the blocks layer. Because even though I have the referenced files layers, I still have the block instance that exists on a layer. So with the block on the blocks layer, I can turn off the block if I want to. But we also have access to the layers that are within the block reference. So here it is, the bridge and the concrete layers that are within that, they're showing up as these kind of grayed out layers, which is what we wanted. Okay? So I have those set up. Um, they're available there. And now I can work with this bridge file. So first off, let's move it up. I'm going to type V for vertical. Uh, you know, let's go up, I don't know, 10 feet, something like that. There it is. And let's go ahead and copy this a few times. So I'll type copy. And we'll start to make the bridge by connecting a bunch of these together. Whoops. All right, so obviously I'm putting a bunch of these together. I could, I could go even further with them, et cetera. So now I have these, these various pieces that have gone together. And I can go ahead and I could render them. But the other thing that I can do, because they're block references, let me go ahead and save this file first. Um, and let's put it into today's folder. OK, so I saved it as final scene. I can actually open up Rhino again. If I, if in, while well, I'm waiting for this to open, if I was in Rhino and I went to file open, it would open the new file on top of this other file. And I want to keep two parallel files open at the same time. So that's why I went into Rhino and tried to open Rhino again. So let's see if I can get it to open up. Come on. There we go. Now I can open that bridge file. So let me go to live demonstrations. Oops. All right, so there's that bridge file again. So I have that open, and I also have the one where I have a bunch of them copied, the bunch of block reference files. Now, the cool thing about this is I can come back here and say, you know what, I really I don't like these, these two wood blocks. I'd rather have them be metal or, or I don't, glass, I don't know, something else. So I could take those two blocks, I could go back to my materials, and I could change the materials. I could also modify them such that I just got rid of them, or maybe I let me take these two, let me move them, and then I'll rotate 3D. Maybe I want it. No, I really wanted them standing up. I don't know. It doesn't matter for right now. 
When I'm done with that, if I go to File and then Save, and I save that file, it's important that I have to save that file, I can come back to this file here, and I can go to Edit, Blocks, Block Manager. And notice right here under my blocks, it says linked file is newer. So I made a change in the other file. It's registering that that change has been made. So let me go ahead and update that. This will pop up about the materials. I always click replace the existing materials, apply all. And lo and behold, the change that I made on one file repopulates across my file. So this works for materials. It works for geometry. So anything that, any changes that you make, it's a really powerful thing to do, right? To set this up as a block and then use that over and over again uh, as you go forward. So let's do the same thing with that glass piece so that we can make the wall. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back to this file. I'll go to File and then Open. And I'm going to open up the glass piece right here. Okay. So yours should look something like this, but we want to make sure that we clean up the layers. So in this file, I didn't clean up the layers just yet. So here, we probably have uh, a main layer, and we should call that, I don't know, uh, window. We need a sub-layer for window glass, and we need a sub-layer for uh, spider clamp. Um, I can, by the way, like on the spider clamp here, it's not part of the window layer just yet. But if I drag it on top, it will then become a, a sub-layer. So there we go. I have the window glass. I have the spider clamp. I have the, the window. I don't want the rest of this stuff, so we'll get rid of those. If you had an infinite plane or a light or any of that stuff needs to go away. Okay. So now, let me take the glass piece and we'll assign it to the window glass layer. I'll take the, the clamp and assign that to my um, spider clamp layer. Then I need to make sure that my materials are assigned. So I'll go into my V-Ray materials. Let's load the material. So the first one um, was the metal. So I'll go into V-Ray, V-Ray materials, and we'll go to metal. And again, you could pick anything that you wanted. Uh, I'll pick a uh, matte titanium. I'll apply material to layer, and I want to apply it to the spider clamp. So now that's been applied. The metal doesn't matter so much how the texture mapping looks. If I switch over into my rendered mode and we zoom in on it, you know the metal essentially looks gray. So I'm not going to worry too much about the texture mapping on that. I'll double check the final rendering, but I don't think that's going to matter so much. Then we get into the glass itself. Uh, if we had an environment installed, we could use real glass and we get reflections. Remember I talked about last time, glass is just really hard. So you're more than welcome to try loading real glass because we might get a reflection of the bridge in it. So we'll give it a shot. I'm going to go ahead and right click load material. I'm going to go into my uh, V-Ray materials here. We'll go into glass. I have a variety of different glasses that has been selected. I'm just going to do basic glass. And I'm going to apply that material to my layer. That is my window glass layer. There it is. And we see that it's somewhat transparent now, like that. The whole thing needs to be moved so that it's right at 0. 0.000. That's the insertion point of the block. And then I'll go ahead and I'll save this. So let me save as. And we'll call this uh, window. And I'll go ahead and click Save, and that saves it. I'm going to switch then over into this file, and I'm going to stick that window along the wall here. Or I'm going to make a wall out of it. So let me go into my Edit Blocks, Insert Block Instance. I could press Control i I don't want to insert the bridge again. I want to go find that glass wall. So let me come back here. There's my window. There it is. All the rest of the options are fine. Remember, we want it to be a linked file and a reference. I'll go ahead and say OK. And there it is. I'll go ahead and just drop it down here somewhere. It's not in the correct orientation for me, so I'm going to do a rotate on it. 
my center of rotation, I'll pick the glass here. And I want it to go in that direction so that it can go behind my bridge. Okay, So now I have this little piece. And I really want a bunch of these. And so I could go, I could go copy, and I could copy this you know, from here, and I could do that. But that's going to take too long if I want you know, 50 of them or something. So instead, I'm going to use uh, an array, which is going to copy it in multiple directions. So I'll just type array, and I'll hit Enter. And it's going to ask me first the number in the x direction. So I kind of have to pay attention to which the directions are. So way down here in this little corner, See how I have x, y, and z? Okay. The number in the x direction going backwards is only 1, so I'm going to leave it as 1. The number in the y direction, OK, this one's going to matter. Um, let's do maybe 20. The number in the z direction is how many going up? I don't know, uh, 6. Y spacing or first reference point? Okay. So it's asking for how, what's the spacing going to be? I know that this glass panel is four feet, so I could just type four feet. But sometimes it's easier to actually click somewhere on your object and say that, no, I want it to go from there to there. You see how it gives me that, that repetition? Then it's going to ask me for my z spacing or first reference point. Same thing, but I want to go up in the z direction. So we'll go from here up into that direction, like that. Now it says, press Enter to accept. So what Rhino does is it gives us the option to double check, is that what we want, or do we want more or, or less? Okay. So in this case, you know what? Let's go a few more. Let's go maybe 10 high. Okay. Maybe, I want my, my, maybe I want a few more in this direction. Let's go 30. So I just created 300 glass panels in a couple clicks. Makes life pretty easy. But if this wasn't a block reference, the file would start to get slow because there's so much geometry. Remember how much work went into creating that little spider with those little blocks and the, the clamps and all that stuff? It's a lot of geometry to keep track of. But because it's a block reference, it's pretty light on this, the, the system power. So I'll press Enter to accept, and I now have my whole wall set up. I probably need to make a few more adjustments. Let me look at it in the top view here. Let's take all of these and let's move them down just a little bit. Let me go to Move. Maybe like that. I just wanted it to be nicely behind my object here. We'll make the perspective view a little bit faster. And actually, you can tell, and you will be able to tell, that it'll slow down a little bit because of this, this uh, repetition of geometry. Now, the nice thing here is that uh, actually, all of these objects should be on the blocks layer, change object layer. If we were working in this and we needed to speed things up, we could just turn off these, these pieces. And, and that, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't take up quite so many system resources. So let me get in here toward my view here just a little bit. We'll go about like that. Zoom in a little bit more. There we go. So we have the nice wall behind. We have the bridge in front, as ugly as it is. and then. A couple more adjustments to my V-Ray settings. I'll go into Options. I want my environment to have a white background. And I'll say OK. You could also, if you want it to reflect a little bit of a light blue, you could pick a blue, you know, kind of a very light blue. That would be OK, too. And then we'll go ahead and we'll give it a render. Now remember, on the render, if we want what we see is what we get, we would go into my Output drawer, and I'd say Get View Aspect which means I'm going to get the whole um, viewport instead of just a, a clipped portion of it. I can click the lock button next to it so it stays at that resolution. And then we'll go ahead and give it a shot in our rendering. And remember, I picked basic glass. I don't know whether the glass is really going to turn out or not, or whether it's going to be too bright. Um, in this case, it might be too bright, certainly for you guys to see. But we'll let it go through its processing, et cetera. So there's two goals today for what you're trying to do. The first goal is to understand what texture mapping is and how to apply it to a variety of different objects, and therefore practice assigning materials and that sort of thing. And then the second part is to use a block reference to bring in multiple copies of, of your geometry and assemble them together in one plane. So we'll let this continue for a little bit and see what, see what comes out of it. Remember. Environments make a big difference when we deal with glass and reflections and that sort of thing. So 
if this doesn't look quite perfect, it's not the end of the world. Okay, it's more about the skills. Are there any questions about this stuff? Not so far? Question? No? All right. So I'll turn you guys loose. Practice with it. Practicing is good right now. If you finish a little bit early, start thinking about your table and chair. There's no reason you can't start on the geometry for that as well. Okay, remember it should be your own table and chair, not something that you copied from somebody else. And uh, you know, have fun with it. It should be fun for you to design a table and chair. And gravity doesn't matter. I'm not going to go in and say that would never hold up. Okay, you 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 have some freedom there. So I realized that I forgot to uh, explain something particularly clearly. Thanks to you guys for for asking for the clarification in the first place. And that is what these these texture mapping projections really mean and how they work. And I think maybe this might clarify a few of your, your, your things. Sometimes when I'm explaining things, I get ahead of myself. And I didn't explain this in its, in its entirety. So I went back to the cylinder, because I think this is probably the easiest one to illustrate this on. And that is that if I apply to this cylinder a box map. So let me go into properties. I'll go to text, texture mapping, and I'll apply a box mapping to it. When I do that, bounding box, world, capped, yes. Okay, we look at this object and it's like, okay, well that looks reasonable. Okay, but the way, if I look carefully at it, there's a point as we go around. See that seam that runs down there? And likewise, if I come around, there's another seam. The way that this projection is happening, we can look at it as, if I show the mapping on it there, it's projecting as if it were a box. So what we do is we take the image of the texture. And there's more to textures. We'll talk about what bump maps are and, and that sort of thing. But if we think of it just as a photograph of the bricks, and we take that photograph and we paste it right here on that uh, side of this, this square, and we project it to the surface itself, and, and it just sticks on the surface. Then we turn the corner to right here, we stick the same image and we project it onto the side of the, the cylinder as well. When we do that though, we end up with a seam that's at 45 degrees to the circle. That, that seam right there is, is right there in the corner. So do you guys see how that works? So we're projecting one way and the other way, and when it intersects the circumference of the circle, we end up with that seam. If, however, I changed the mapping on this object, to be a cylindrical mapping, Let's say bounding box, world, there we go. Don't worry about what the top looks like. And we looked all the way around this object, that seam doesn't exist anymore because it's as if we took the flat piece of paper that had the texture on it, curled it around the outside of our object, and then projected it onto the object all the way around. It gets complicated, obviously, on the top and the bottom, though, because we've got that curl that goes around and then how do we how do we reassign the material on the top and the bottom which is why is it capped or, or is it not capped and so we have a few other options in here as as we go through it if i if i applied and i didn't even talk about these cuz they're so not common to to do it but if i applied a planar mapping for example oh yeah we can still say bounding box world that's fine uh, we'll do it as uv in that case it takes our map and says, OK, it's just a plane. It's just a square. And it projects from the top down. OK, we get a perfect projection on the sides. But then it just stretches whatever color. So right here, we see there's the white bit of grout. It just stretches that down the side, because it's only projecting from the top down. If I manipulated this, this mapping widget here, if, say, oops, if I took that and I rotated that, say up like that it would project it on that side of the of the cylinder and it would start to stretch as we got to the sides and it would stretch along the top so does that kind of make sense so that's how the mapping works we take the flat piece and we project it on so as we start to to get into the more uh, complicated mappings that's where they it breaks down because we can't do it as easily um, and the projection doesn't happen as easily. But for the most part, all that you're going to be working with on most shapes are the defaults, the square, 
the uh, spherical and or the cylindrical mapping. And the more closely they resemble what you're doing, let's say you had a, uh, a setup of, of a house with a curving wall. You might do box mapping for the rectangular walls. And then when you got to the curving wall, you'd do a uh, cylindrical mapping to, to make that texture follow along the curve. Okay, but that's how they're applied. That's how they're projected. And I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and hopefully it helped you see how it works a little bit better. Okay, that was it. Thank you for letting me interrupt you again.